Thank you so much for getting up so early. Well, it's not early. It, must, it might be the, the Irish whiskey I had last night. No, just kidding. So it's wonderful to see you. Yeah, it's, we, we were last in conversation in November, right, in, right. in Paris. Eddie came to Paris uh, for the publication of his brilliant book on James Baldwin in French, and I had the, the opportunity to be in conversation with you and, and watch you electrify a French crowd. Well, and, get, and, and get the translator upset. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I've always wanted to talk with you, uh, Thomas, about your work. Um, I find your magazine writing just beautiful. Thank you. Um, and of course, your, your books provocative and insightful and brilliant in so many ways. There are moments when I disagree, obviously, and moments when I'm just um, really taken with the sentences. Talk a little bit about what's at the heart of, let's, let's focus on the books for a minute, and we can begin to have a conversation from there. Talk about what's at the heart of, of in some ways, these two memoirs. You know, from losing my cool to self-portrait in black and white. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Sure, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm the son of a, of a black man from the segregated South. My father was born in 1937. Um, in, in, in Longview, Texas, and grew up in Galveston. And my mother's a white evangelical Protestant from, from San Diego. And I was raised in the 80s and 90s in New Jersey, very much um, with the American custom that a drop of black blood makes, makes a person black, primarily because they're um, disqualified from this notion of the purity of whiteness. Um, and culturally, that seemed very normal to me, and the white kids I grew up around with uh, didn't think I was white, and the black kids I grew up around with were, were used to, you know, having people look all manners of ways physically and be black. So it wasn't really, I, I grew up in a very American way of thinking that race was a binary, and, and that I was black and therefore my children would be black because they would always have a drop of black blood. Mm -hmm. So the two books, I, I'm really glad that you asked about the two books, though, because you know, I, I don't think that, I didn't set out to, to be a serial memoirist or think I had such a crazy life that it had to be constantly probed, but you know, I, in America, the question of race and what it means for the self and for the society is always there. And I just found that when I was trying to think through um, what is black dignity, what is human dignity, how do, how do we transcend some of these um, original inequities that keep coming up every generation. Whenever I thought about how to tackle those questions, I had personal kind of voices in my head, primarily my father's, but many other voices, and so the writing became personal. So the first book is really a coming of age book, um, thinking through the very different America that I grew up in than my father grew up in. And it's critical of the culture that I was immersed in, thinking that in some ways my friends and I were self-sabotaging ourselves in ways that my father I, just, I guess I would say didn't have the luxury of even doing. Um, and then the second book, 10 years later, is um, if the first was a, fa a, 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 a father-son memoir where I'm the son, the second is a, a father-daughter memoir, really, um, where now I'm um, thinking through the implications of having um, a child that I know uh, in a place like Louisiana would have been black enough to have been enslaved in, a, in another time, but who has blonde hair, blue eyes, and white skin, and the world reads as white in Paris where we live. And so thinking through what these categories even mean if she's, um, if, she, if I'm a black man who can have a daughter who looks like this, and if she's a white projecting person who um, could have been enslaved and is 25% descended from West Africa. Yeah, so... I mean, this is not me interviewing you, but obviously it is. <laughs> um, race registers differently in Paris, right? But there's a sense in which the way in which you're trying to, when I read you, break loose from these categories, the hold of these categories, um, there's also a kind of politics underneath it, right? There's this kind of personal... Uh, um, journey that you're charting, and I really want to think more about your father, because he's this guy who said, you're going to be black, you're going to be black, and then is the guy who's, who named you Thomas Chatterton, after Thomas Chatterton, an English poet, right? So, and he's a PhD in sociology, mm -hmm. right? So um, talk about the politics behind this, often how you're read. Yeah. Right? That's, does that make sense? Yes, it does, because you're not in charge of how you're, you're read. Right. Or, you know, I, 
the politics of this, in this moment, is that you're often read as being um, what's called a black conservative, which I, you know, which I never thought of myself as being. Um, politically, I vote left, and you know, I think that my views on a lot of issues are pretty much indistinguishable from where the liberal center left consensus would be. You know, I'm not, I'm not a communist, but you know, I, I, th I think that. On most things, that, that would be I would be uncontroversial. But the one thing that makes me a conservative is that um, I don't think about um, racial categories uh, in, in the paradigms that I think I'm expected to. Mm. And I think that um, there's a few. You know, John McWhorter gets it. Uh, Glenn Lowry. Um, there's a few of us who get lumped together all the time. But I think that actually my politics are to the left of most of the people that I get lumped with. I agree, because when people read you in the same line, I mean, I had a conversation on, on MSNBC with John McWhorter, mm -hmm. right? And, and former president of MSNBC is back there and founder of Mississippi Today, Andy Lack. We just want to just give him a shout out over here. Um, but uh, I don't read you in that way, right? I, I see a much more um, uh, subtle, uh, I appreciate you saying that, but that's because you and I, I think, have followed each other on Twitter for a long time, and you interacted with me as an individual before, um, before it's just like a Twitter avatar or something like that. I think we had DM'd or spoken. And so maybe it's, there's a human element where it, it, I think part of the problem is that social media reduces people to banners of teams. Mm. You know, your, 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 your social media profile becomes a projection of whatever team you're supposed to represent in every, every time you utter a statement. And, and so then at that point, you don't, a lot of people don't have the time or aren't inclined to engage the individual or to think through the subtlety that a book requires that a tweet doesn't. So I think part of how I've been read more and more conservatively is, is, is a function of the problem that I have with Twitter and, and being on it too much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, recently you just had one. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> um, this is the one with Nicole Hannah-Jones oh, and so the op-ed in the New York Times. Yeah. I've never Give, a little, give us a little color around that op-ed and, and the situation. Some of, since we're in New Orleans and we don't want to assume that everybody's reading the damn New York Times, right? We read the <laughs> Times-Picayune down here, right? That's what I'm looking <laughs> Well, there was a there was an op-ed in the New York Times that got quite a lot of attention last week that went viral um, by a college student, an undergrad at UVA, who said that you know she feels and many people she knows privately feel that they uh, self-censor that they're not able to express um, uh, views because there's a kind of enforced consensus in the classroom and on campus. Um, you know, that other people have, we've been talking about this for a few years now that people feel in the workplace that, you know, and this was rejected widely. This, this op-ed was kind of panned because the, the reaction that I saw a lot was that, well, you're complaining about being censored in the New York Times as an undergrad at UVA, so clearly you have a platform and, you know, you can say what you think <laughs> and it's not, it's not exactly mm. um, so oppressive. But I think there is actually a real conversation to be had about that. And so I ended up um, disagreeing with, I, I thought that someone like, I guess what struck me was that Nicole Hannah-Jones in a position of enormous power and influence maybe doesn't always think of herself as being the power. I think that oftentimes people, um, it, it, it's hard to update your sense of yourself as being the person with almost a million followers with the MacArthur, with, with a very um, safe staff position at a publication and pretty much free to say whatever you think and other people have to kind of gauge how they're gonna to respond to you because responding to, being seen responding to you the wrong way could impact their own standing. I think sh people like her, I think, may not be aware that they are the power mm -hmm. uh, from a many other people's perspective. And so when she attacked this girl or when she criticized this girl, I just, you know, I said that this actually reinforces the dynamic where someone, where somebody seeing that, the next person to speak up might say, well, I don't want to get called out by someone so famous and influential that way. And so they might actually narrow what they feel comfortable saying themselves. And I, it's a debate to ha be had, but the way that it goes back and forth on Twitter is that it's, it's a snipe back and forth. Yeah, you sniped back. You, <laughs> you gave a screenshot of one of her college essays. Yeah. Tweet. Now, obviously, I was trolling. <laughs> you did your research. Before. I was. I wasn't paying attention, but I, I didn't let him know that I was paying attention. But, you know, 
So that snapshot was, a, was, was, was more than a jab. Well, I think it's actually, it's, I think it's not irrelevant because I would say that you shouldn't be actually, um, I would say that whatever she wrote in college has nothing to do with what she writes today. Mm -hmm. But I would also say that, you know, she was saying that this, this girl, we're treating her with kid gloves because, you know, she's a full adult and, and, and she's publishing. And so I said, well, no, I mean, you, you, you wrote some things in college that you would probably, you know, feel like you weren't fully your adult self writing. Um, and here it is. Yeah, and here it is, and, 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 and that's the dynamic. Yeah, and, I'm, uh, and you know, and it's true, when you sit back and you reflect about it, you participate in an algorithm-driven dynamic that doesn't necessarily encourage you to, I, if, if I were to sit with her and talk about this, we would have a very different conversation right. than we do on social media. And that's why I was shocked at it, to be honest with you, Thomas. There, there's a way in which my understanding of you, we both have, uh, um, a genuine love for James Baldwin. He actually broke in the house. Didn't he, mm -hmm. he jumped, we have to tell the story about he broke in the house in St. Paul Devance, right? Or you have to tell the story. So we love Jimmy, right? And we also have a similar sensibility. I mean, we might argue over whether Toni Morrison's Beloved is better than Ralph Ellison's <laughs> Oh Man. Or we're gonna, maybe we can talk about that as well. Or, or Richard Wright's um, Native Son. But there's this sense in which when I saw you do that, and I said, that's why you get lumped with McWhorter. Because mm. that's precisely what John would do. That's precisely what Glenn may do. Because, I mean, for example, when I was having the conversation with, with John on MSNBC, John was reasonable. But he is. Yeah, I know, is. but when I read Woke, <laughs> I didn't think that was, I, I was like, this is a disconnect. Because he didn't think I had read it uh, before we had, fin or had finished it. And you know, they're coming after your children. That, that mm -hmm. kind of formulation was not the kind of formulation that he was making on national television. And I just see, I, I knew that there was a more nuanced argument because of the thing that you did with Jason, professor of philosophy mm -hmm. at Yale around free speech. Mm -hmm. So how do you navigate these kind of well, poles I mean, and, and tendencies in life? I'll answer that and I'd like to ask you too sure, because thanks. I think that you, if I recall from following you for a few years, not like eight years or nine years, you used to tweet more and you tweet less now. And I think that that's actually like basically the, the, the answer to the question of all questions. You, know, you, you should tweet less, write more, mm. do more um, conversations like this where you, can, where you can think through a topic with some subtlety. But there's this kind of pressure that I think, you know, I think Nicole is very much part of this dynamic and I certainly find myself trapped in it where there's this pressure to react and engage um, and the more followers you have, the more opportunity there is always to be saying something and oftentimes you're talking about more things than, you know, I had this conversation with Stanley Crouch uh, years ago, um, <laughs> the late great Stanley Crouch, he said that, you know, most people can only really have a serious opinion about five or six things, you know? But, you know, we, we are constantly living in a, in, a, in a society now where the COVID experts did a quick pivot to Ukraine, you know, but like last summer they were the Afghan, Afghanistan experts and, you, right. and, you know, they're the political analysts uh, every four years. And, and, this, and we're all participating in it. And I think that you model a kind of path that I, you know, I have to take more seriously, which is to tweet less. Because I don't know what I really gained out of like engaging her because I didn't change her mind and everybody that agrees with me already agreed with me. Right, right. And one of the, you know, so, see. And I, just, and I potentially alienated a friend like you who sees that I don't know you see it and, and then you say, oh, I thought Thomas was this way, but he's this way. So I think it, it opens up a lot of dynamics that actually are not necessarily worth as much as we seem to think they are. Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons why I tweet less is because, you know, we did, my department did the, the, the analytics around my Twitter feed. <laughs> <laughs> and when you tweet, it's not just to your followers. Yeah. It's to a whole network of yeah. folk. And so if you're just reacting right, viscerally to something, it's going to enter into a network of conversations that could have implications well beyond that initial reaction. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I would tweet something 
and then suddenly it would make its way up the food chain <laughs> and become a part of a, a new cycle for a minute. And they said, okay, right? You gotta vet this stuff, you gotta be careful, you gotta they be that. thoughtful. That's what, I'm, oh, that's yeah, what, that's what said, we yeah. concluded. Mm -hmm. Because when it goes to, so you might have a hundred real serious influencers following. Yeah, that don't always react to you. You don't know what their, you don't know what their impression is. You don't even know if they're following. They're trolling following. you. Right, you don't know. And then boom, you drop it and you go, oh, right? And so, and then for me, I've been, perp you know, as Russia and Ukraine, as Russia invaded Ukraine, I, I haven't been on television because that's not my wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking about what it doesn't mean for Russia at, to invade Ukraine. When in my wheelhouse, these two spaces have been the sites of a particular understanding of global whiteness, where Russia has been at the center of a white Christian imaginary, a white nationalist imaginary, and Ukraine, odd as it sounds, has been the hub of global neo-Nazism. And so what does it mean for these two to collide, even with Zelensky as a, as a heroic figure yeah. at, the hel at the helm? But I can't say that on television in the midst of a war because I don't have the space to think through it. And one of the things I love about reading you, whether it's your long form magazine pieces or even your books, is that there's a thoughtfulness here. You're bringing the fullness of your bibliography to bear. There's a reading here. It's not where you're translating you know, the work of those of us in the academy for a broader public. No, you're thinking through something. And one of those, one, one, one something is this vexed question of identity mm -hmm. that we have to wrap our minds around that then gets you read in a certain way. Talk about, for me, you, then you can switch it up. I'm, I know you didn't expect me to. No, it was, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be having this conversation. Yeah, talk a little bit about this obsession with identity that led you to the form, and then talk about the resources, their intellectual resources, that you bring to bear on your in how you inhabit the form and pursue the question. That, that's that, a, I mean, that's, I think that there's an American obsession with identity. Um, that's true. And I think that I'm probably an American that thinks more than average about my identity and the identity of others. I mean, I'm, I'm quintessentially American and obsessing over identity. But Even in Paris? But in Paris, that's the thing that made me realize that this, is, this feels very American and that uh, I think about identity more is leaving America, living in Europe and Paris mostly for 10 years and realizing that not everybody thinks about some of these same questions in exactly the same ways. That I actually, like my children in French public schools, there's lots of mixed children, but they don't actually obsess over the, the one drop in the way that we do. And oftentimes, they have a very different vocabulary for describing themselves. And just when I first moved to Paris, even before I became a father, just hearing myself explain when people would ask what my, what they call your origins are, when you explain who you are, where you're from, what they mean by that is race, but hearing myself just repeat plantation logic over and over again to people that don't grow up in a society that necessarily What's plantation logic for you? The laws of hypodescent. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the, the idea that after 132nd and um, ans African ancestry, you become white, but anything, you know, but, but anything below that uh, makes you enslavable, that, that whiteness equals freedom and uh, all these things, you know, Europe has a history that's, you know, very involved in all, all over the world with slavery, but they didn't have slavery within their national borders, and so they never developed this kind of um, urgency and, 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 and need to enforce um, what essentially amount to the Nuremberg Law is this kind of precision about mm. race. They just don't have that. And so just hearing myself explain an American obsession with identity made me kind of step outside of it and realize I wanted to interrogate it more and more. What does it mean when you're often read as Arab? Do people just come up? So do you find yourself sometimes somebody just speaking? Well, Arabic yeah. When I used to, when I used to I used to have like shave my head and uh, and then without the, the the hair visible, people would just come up to me speaking Arabic and say, "Why didn't your parents teach you to speak your language?" <laughs> <laughs> and now does that does that kind of so there's no uh, history of slavery, but the kind of colonial legacy right. defined. How does because Bald, Baldwin will say right. 
I didn't trade the American fantasy for the French one. Right. And he but, looks to see how they're treating the Algerians. So when you're being read, your body is being read as Arab, how does that then play itself out in terms of how you think? About so th this gets into a really interesting discussion. I hope that this is, you know, we said we were going to talk about optimism, but. <laughs> this is <help. laughs> This is what we do. We're going to talk about optimism. <laughs> but this is really uh, fascinating to me, too, because, and I do get into this a bit in the book, because when I first moved to France just for a year, I lived in the north of France in a heavily Arab area on the border of Belgium teaching English. And I, and I, and I, was, uh, I was broke. I was straight out of college, and I had no social capital that anybody recognized. And so I was read much more as Arab then. Now, I live in Paris. I live with, uh, I have a, I, I, to be completely honest, I have a white wife. Mm -hmm. And uh, she has certain class signifiers about her. And we have children. And, and I'm almost never read as an Arab anymore. They don't, I'm not read as white. but. I'm just American or something like that, mm. but I don't actually get the people coming up to me. That's fascinating. Um, and I think that there is some way that you're read uh, by the people that you're also with, the, the people that you're married to, the people that you procreate with, reflect a racial reading back on you because there is no scient scientific basis for our understanding of race. There, these, are, these are signifiers. Right, right. So I suppose we should talk about optimism. So I want to ask you a question sure. because I, suggested that title for this conversation right like the day after watching the Super Bowl. And I, I actually, I, there was something very moving to me sitting over in Europe realizing that could never happen. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not going to change everybody's life, but Dr. Dre and that halftime show and that being assimilated into the kind of American mainstream and the way it was in that spectacle, it, that just wouldn't be allowed to happen in France or in other places. You're not going to get a Turkish halftime show in <laughs> Germany, uh, you know, right, during a right. major football game. It's not going to happen. And I think it does say something. It moved me to see. And I, I, I was trying to think why, and then I was thinking I wanted to talk about it with you. And I wondered if it moved you, and I don't think it did. <laughs> no. I, I, tweeted, I tweeted that I wasn't going to watch the Super Bowl. That's right. So you didn't even see this moving? So, so, you, so I saw, I mean, obviously it was all over my Twitter feed. I went on Brother From Another on, on MSNBC's Peacock. Um, and I said, and I was in one of my moods, and I said, <laughs> the NFL can kiss my ass. <laughs> because I was, I was like, why should I consume this product um, when how many black coaches? Right. When there's the situation that it was happening, the, the class action suit from the former coach, a black Honduran, you can't just read him as African American, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, from Bronzeville, uh, a foul suit, and here the Rooney rule, and I'm a, I'm a rabid Pittsburgh Steelers fan. <laughs> Even though I grew up watching Archie Manning and the Saints, that's why I'm a Steelers fan. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> right? Because, um, you know, it was the Saints on one channel and then the Steelers, because the Steelers were great during that time period. <laughs> um, so, um, and so for me, uh, I was just, and then I was thinking about, you know, Colin Kaepernick and the mm -hmm. way in which the NFL responded to Black Lives Matter compared to the NBA. So I didn't watch it. And then when I saw the video footage, I was just struck by, you know, what is, it, what is this journey? I'm not a hip hop, I'm a tweener. So mm -hmm. losing my cool is mm -hmm. not, so, you know, That's I remember listening. Yeah. I grew up with the Al Green Wicked Chair album, <laughs> you know, with the white yeah, suit yeah. And, and the first generation of hip hop, uh -huh. you know, Houdini and Curtis Blow and those folk. So gangster rap for me to make this transition from the streets of mm -hmm. Compton to the stage of, of, of the Super Bowl, right, to me just signaled the power of capitalism, but it, it, to absorb. But that's these partially forms. why. Um, it's partially why I think there is a different level of mainstream assimilation for American blacks than there is for minorities in, say, Western European societies, because there is quite a lot of African American power through capitalism, uh, purchasing power, and and you know, influencing power. I mean that halftime show showed me that, you know, these guys in Compton made something that the whole world consumes. Yeah. You know, and it's a brand, the Compton, that is legible in Japan and legible in France. And people loved that halftime show in France. And 
it just, there is not something equivalent outside of America for uh, such an oppressed population to have achieved. And, you know, that can make you want to holler or it can make you kind of optimistic. Uh, well, you know, I mean, I think, you know, that, that's, that's a fascinating formulation, Thomas. I mean, it, so when I think about um, black cultural production in the United States, when I think about our music, I was literally listening to John Coltrane's Out mm -hmm. of This World before I came here. Why, I don't know, but I was listening to it and I was being, then I, then I immediately went to Coltrane's Pursuance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I was thinking about this yeah. form, right? Or I think about the blues, I'm from Mississippi, man. Right, and, and the, the, this blues scale predicated upon this, the most unstable chord you can imagine mm -hmm. as the ground for this art that gives expression to these people who are enduring material conditions that can only be described as absurd, as it were. Mm -hmm. And the way in which the country has absorbed these cultural uh, artifacts, these cultural, you know, this art. And made it the basis of their entire popular music. Exactly, and, but it's the first art form yeah. because it shows the incredibly maddening relationship of the nation to these folk. Right. I mean, think about the first art form, it's minstrelsy. Right. Why? If you ever get a chance to read, <laughs> yeah, remember Ellison's wonderful essay, Change the Joke, Slip the Yoke in mm -hmm. Shadow and Act. Mm -hmm. If you haven't read that essay, read it immediately, <laughs> right? Because it is a kind... This, is, this is the passion you bring to saying that beloved is better than an invisible we had, man. <laughs> we had this in a cafe in, in Paris where we, were, we had a serious argument over which novel was better. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so for me, what, what you're describing as a scene of optimism is actually re repetition. Mm. It is what the country has done with what black people, the crude generalization that mm -hmm. it is, have produced. And I couldn't, I didn't participate in it because I but was I, too busy being pissed with the NFL. So what do you think about this though? The, so minstrelsy is a good way of thinking about it because there, I don't want to, I'm not an expert on this, but it seems to me that there's not an equivalent of that twisted but also, you know, thin line between love and hate, kind of obsessive, close relationship. There is not that between the Frenchmen and um, the minorities that now populate. Um, it all depends on metropole. where you are. There, there may be the closest thing would be with Algeria, but, but there's, a, there's really more hatred than there is love for Algerian culture. Right. You know, there, there is not a kind of, there is something, you know, there is something, black, uh, black people in the South were raising, Faulkner, you know, mm. we're raising white children. There is something intertwined, and the culture that, that, that black people produced that is quintessentially American culture, it can't be denied. I can't think of a parallel for that. I, I, I totally agree, you know, but I think the intimacy, uh, the, the intimacy here, in Algeria is the source of the bloodiness. It's true that of the, the closest thing war. happens to the, the, the Pied Noir who were who believed that they were also Algerian because that was their land. There was a passionate love of that place and need to be part of it that became this horrific violence that you can only be violent with somebody that you feel that passionately about. And and you see underneath Camus and you see underneath yeah. Derrida. All of that yeah. it seems to me. Yeah. But yeah, you know, I think you know, this is why I, I refuse to cede America to those who believe that I should just simply be grateful to be here. Precisely because of your dis America is more than an idea to my, into my mind. America is an argument, a fight with bodies left in the wake, right? And, and here where, it's where remember, I, I, I think I mentioned this to you in the past, I wrote all of my, when I, my first year of graduate school, I wrote all of my essays on Ellison. Right. Because I was an Ellison man. I liked his elegant pose, mm -hmm. right? I liked the sophistication of his argument, right? Um, and it's Ellison who convinced me not to see this argument around America, that, you know, we are at the center of it. And right, it's precisely that. That, that was that his case for optimism, to. though. Yeah, it's not, I'm not an optimist. At all. <laughs> mm. Optimism? Nah. 
You know, I, 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 again, I'm, I'm, I'll say this because I was asking you all these questions earlier, so now you're talking. See, I'm, I'm enjoying my conversation. When I enjoy conversation, I start playing with my feet and <laughs> moving and doing this. So I'm sorry. I, I just heard my mom in the back, stop playing with your feet. Um, um, I'm not an optimist. I don't believe in that kind of Panglossian, this is not Voltaire's Candide, you know, this is not the best of all possible worlds, you know. Uh, I'm a, I, I, have, I have this kind of blues-soaked sensibility. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, that moment in Du Bois's of the passing of the firstborn in The Souls of Black Folk, published in 1903, where he says, it's a hope not hopeless, but unhopeful. A hope not hopeless, but unhopeful. So there's this sense in which, like my great-grandmama used to say to me when I came home from Morehouse all angry, you know white folks ain't gonna change. You better stop dwelling on that, it'll eat you up. Now let's move on. But, so uh, that, I have a question for you. Do, do you think that there has been some change though? That white people have changed in what is white people? There's, there's Trump voting white people, there's, there's Bernie white people, but like, has there been some shift in a kind of mainstream liberal white sensibility? I'm possible, obviously, you know, look at me. I'm always the kind of poster child for American exceptionalism and progress, as it were. Um, but I, I keep, I, you know there's that moment in Baldwin's Evidence of Things Not Seen, his last book about the Atlanta child murders? And he makes this distinction that I love, that I think we need to think about. He says, I happen to love a lot of people who happen to be white, and then they're white people. <laughs> That's the distinction but, I make. But that's a distinction that's very subtle that I don't think um, it gets short shrift um, on social media. What he meant was that, <laughs> what he meant, because he says it throughout his writing, was that blackness and whiteness aren't real and to believe in them is to believe in your own, you know, um, you're going to diminish yourself and, and actually like lose yourself in believing that the skin is real. Mm -hmm. But he's saying that uh, these people, these individual white people, these are individuals that I love, and he's saying that whiteness is a construct oh. and, and, and that people participate in whiteness. And he would probably agree that p even people who are non-European descended can participate in whiteness. Exactly. You know? and so, but that's not the, the level of conversation that, that we, we have this. We, we tend to, there tends to be um, a slippage between individual white people and the construct of whiteness. Right, because I think, and that, that slippage happens all the time, I think, because it requires a risk. Baldwin writes this in 63 in, 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 in The Fire Next Time, and he's talking about this with regards to police officers. Will I take the risk that you're going to be a human being today? Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's a great line. Right? Will I take the risk that you're going to be a human being today? Or, you know, you have whiteness, and then you have individual people, and then you've got to say, right, okay, I'm from Mississippi, yes, yes, right, I've experienced all of this, uh-huh, uh-huh. Do I come with a kind of earned skepticism about mm -hmm. your moral capacity? That's the great scandal of black life. Because, you know, we tell the story about Martin King and nonviolence and, and the power of love, but the great scandal of black life is a deep, a deep skepticism about the moral capacity of white folks. Now, the reverse racist, no, or is it lived wisdom? So let me ask you <laughs> one question before we get into the audience Q&A. What, what, what are some things that would make you more optimistic? What are some changes that could happen that are realizable? I'm hopeful. Mm -hmm. I've never stopped being hopeful, but I'm never optimistic. <laughs> Nothing's going to make you optimistic. Optimism is the flip side, pessimism is the flip side of optimism, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, you know, the relativist is the flip side of the metaphysics, of the mm -hmm. metaphysicians. Uh, uh, I, I don't believe in metaphysics, so relativism doesn't make sense to me mm -hmm. as a philosophical mm -hmm. position, because they're tied together, yeah. right? So optimism for me is not, is not the option, right? It's like B.B. It's like King's, I use this quote, all, nobody loves me but my mother, and she could be jiving too, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> It's an orientation to the world, right? And so my hope and my faith is in us. I will never lose my faith in the capacity of human beings to be otherwise. And so the conditions under which um, we live together. So yesterday I had a conversation with John Meacham. Mm -hmm. And Meacham expressed explicitly 
The journey, Thomas, from writing the biography of George H.W. Bush, Bush 41, to John Lewis, mm -hmm. and the conclusion that there is this thing underneath America that we, it might not change, and da 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 And it, I think at that moment, he wanted me to say, yes. And then I said, welcome. <laughs> I'm glad you got it now. You would have known it if you would have crossed the railroad tracks a bit earlier. So how do we move from immediate self-congratulation mm. to the conditions are now in place for us to imagine a different way to be together? One where racial justice isn't a philanthropic enterprise yes. or a charitable gesture, but where you can bring the fullness of who you are into relation to the fullness of who I am and we can become friends, lovers, family. I, I, I would say I'm not very far away from I know. you at all. And I would say that you just summed up exactly what I, what I would hope for, too. What I, I know. The vision of society that I think would be a functioning, healthy, multi-ethnic society. Yeah, God willing. Yeah. I, I've been, I've been, I know we got to go to questions because I, I felt this searing <laughs> eyeball. You remember that? You ever seen that image in Emerson's diaries of the eyeball? That's, just felt it right here. <laughs> Yeah. So anyone have any questions? Yes, if you can, go to the microphone. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I, but I ambushed you with all the earlier. No, that's, that's cool. <laughs> Could have kept going. Hi, my name is Mark Morris, and I live in Gentilly, oh. which is mm. close by here. Um, my question's for Thomas, who I've never met before and, or heard of, and it's wonderful. Eddie, of course, I came for you. But my question's for... <laughs> <laughs> So I, I got to do more TV, apparently. <laughs> no, no. That's right. So, Thomas, you said that um, Americans, I forgot the adjective you used, but I'll, I'll, I'll gin it up. Um, we're obsessed about identity. And I want to know what the rest of the world does. Like, can you just expand on that? That was a fascinating, I don't have a context to understand that. So, mm. thank you both. Great question. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so, I think about this a lot. I think, of course, you know, you can't the idea of the Frenchman as a construct, too. What is, there's, there's a million different ways to be uh, any large grouping. But there is a way in which I think older societies, older peoples, um, societies that were rooted uh, for hundreds of years in aristocracy and things like that have a sense of themselves that is different in new societies where people created themselves from scratch relatively not that long ago. You know, America, if it's mm. 400 years old, you know, there are buildings in my neighborhood that are 800 years old, you know? Um, <laughs> and people had a continuous sense of self mm. that entire time that they weren't redefining based on, um, you know, immigration, waves of immigration, things like this. So there is just a way that I think a lot of French people don't go about wondering what it means to be French or redefining Frenchness. And maybe that's a problem now because since the end of World War II, they basically went from being a society that had no Muslims to being a society with maybe six million Muslims. And that's a significant change in 50 years. America has always been a mongrel society, always kind of figuring out what is the American identity? And I just think that that creates a very, you know, maybe, maybe you could make the case that France needs to become a bit more American and, and, and Germany does too, and, and, and people need to think more about how to update their sense of identity. But, but there is not this kind of ongoing um, questioning of what it means to be. Uh, I remember I was, I was interviewing a guy and, and, and he, um, for a piece in The New Yorker about the French far right, and this was a guy that was, you know, a xenophobic nationalist, and he said, you know, you know, like, to ask the question what it means to be French, and so this is not a guy that I approve of, I just oh, want to put that, but he said to, to ask the question what it means to be French already shows that you're not French, you know, and, and... <laughs> It is an identity, but it's not an obsession with an identity is what I guess I was getting. Everybody has an identity. We can't escape, um, we can't escape ourselves. I guess I'm saying isn't that an obsession with identity? You, would know, you wouldn't have to say that if you were my identity. Right, I, yeah, I, I, you could say that, like the, that, that this guy is basically saying that he's being forced to, to talk about identity and, and, and what he wants is a society where he goes back to not having people, newcomers. You could definitely say that this man was exercising a form of white privilege. <laughs> <laughs>
But what, 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 what? Let's be democratic. We've got a whole line. We have a line. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. We're going to be generous. He, well, he, I, I certainly made a good faith effort to answer your question. I think we got to move That's on. Line. Let's be generous. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Robert Wilfong. I, I, uh, um, we can't, could you clear, back up a little bit so we can hear you. There you go. Back up? Or speak up. Speak up, okay. Yes. Uh, so you've made several references to the, to the one drop rule of, of racial classification. And I wanted to ask a question about that. Uh, I, since 2013, I've spent about half the year every year in West Africa, in, in the country of Mali. Uh, not, a, not a settler regime, like 99.999% black. And the first thing I learned in Africa is that many people who are considered black in the United States would not be considered black there. And many people who are considered white there are not considered, would not be considered black in the United States. The, the one drop rule, of course, is the KKK, Jim Crow system of, of racial classification, and we have internalized it so thoroughly, so totally in the United States, we're deeply committed to it. When you spend time in a radically different world like West Africa, after a while, the one drop rule seems totally insane. But here, it's normal. It has become so normalized that we can't see how totally insane it is. How can you communicate that to people? It's very distressing. Thank not, you not for to the be question. Able to do that. I mean, that's essentially a main thread of my of my last book. It, 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 and uh, everything you say, I 100% agree with. And you know, you can you can see the absurdity of racial classification if you just go down to Brazil, for example, where they have the reverse one drop rule, which is a drop of white right. blood makes you not black. Right. And so you have people like Neymar, the soccer star, who's essentially your color, saying, like being asked in an interview if he's ever experienced racism, he goes, oh, no, it's not like I'm black or anything, like my dad's black, but I'm not black. <laughs> and and, and in, in America, he would be like, not even controversially black. He, would, he wouldn't, he would just be a black man in America. Oh, y'all know something about this in New Orleans. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't have to, but uh, <laughs> you, you, you read of people going back to, to Ghana to, to, to see where the, where the, where the slave ships right. departed and, 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 and meeting, meeting Africans who don't think of them as black and having kind of their world shattered because mm -hmm. they're go they see themselves as going home and, and, and Africa, you know, Chimamanda Adichie has written about the fact that she never conceived of herself in racial terms until she came to America because in Africa it's your tribe and your linguistic mm -hmm. community. So mm -hmm. I don't know how you make a worldwide consensus on how we define ourselves. I think you have to think, we're not gonna all get on the same page that way. What do you think? I think we have to cultivate a thick historical sensibility, right, that race, has these historical uh, resonances, and particular national histories matter. So what does is, what is race look like in Brazil? What does it look like in Martinique? What does it look like in, in Portugal? What does it look like in France? What does it look, it's going to have these different historical resonances, and Americans typically think the world reflects itself, right? And we tend to project every, we project ourselves onto the world, and when the world doesn't behave according to our, our assumptions, we are, it's like, you know, walking into the forest in Chinua Achebe's things fall apart and the twins are still alive. You know, <laughs> oh my God, there's an epistemic crisis. I don't know what the world means anymore because it doesn't look like us, right? right? And so part of what we have to do is cultivate a kind of critical sensibility, as it were, right? Um, yeah, yeah, a historical sensibility, yes. Uh, hello, you guys. Um, hey. Uh, my name is Jarvis, and I'm 28 years old. And uh, I have to put a disclosure on my question because I work in philanthropy. But um, I was really fascinated by what the conversation you guys were having by saying, one, America's no number one is an argument. But number two, I think that there's a lot of like ways that philanthropy tries to go about approaching this issue. And I'm curious to know what are your thoughts on get into that level of equality and get into that argument that you say America stands for. Thank you. Um, 
what are your thoughts on when that is taken up by the philanthropic sector? Because you said, as you said, it should not be philanthropic. So this is what I mean, really quickly, because I know we got 16 seconds. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to do a fire round after this. What I mean by this is oftentimes we think of racism in America as being the possession of loud racists, the people who are screaming the N-word, who are wearing you know, white robes and the like. I believe at the heart of it is this belief that white people matter more than others, ought to be valued more than others. And sometimes there's a group among us who believe that race, racial justice is something, racial equality is something that they can give to others. Mm -hmm. And I'm of the view, who are you to give me equality? And if we begin with the assumption that, ra that equality is your possession to give to someone else, we're still locked in a certain frame. Because then racial justice is a philanthropic, a charitable gesture. And we haven't upended the underlying assumptions that have led to the creation of this world that we're in. Racial equality is not yours to give to me, ever. All That's right. a good 16 seconds. That's a good way to end it. <laughs> really quickly, one more, two more, really quickly. We're just going to do them really quickly, and we might not even answer them. But come on, just real quick. I wanted to ask you this question yesterday, Mr. Cloud, when my boss, Mr. Meacham, could have attested to my sincerity, but I'll digest it to this. Is it naive to ask, and is it particularly naive for me, a white northern Jew, to ask, will there ever be a time when the past, no pun intended, does not color the present and the future? No. <laughs> what do you think? Um, we're, we're, we're quick now. Yeah, I think that I have to hope that we can transcend the, the prejudices and conflicts of the past in some future state. You notice the difference in optimism here and hope? You see the difference? <laughs> yes. Last one. Yeah, I'm from Pastristan, Mississippi. That's home. Right down the street from you. Yes, sir. And I ain't jiving. <laughs> okay. Now, hopeful, yes, but with a question mark. 100 years to date, we just got the anti lynching bill passed. Yeah, yeah. So, how much longer do we have to continue to be hopeful? You know, I got a few more days left on the planet. So I want to know, how, how can we continue with this hopefulness? There's a wonderful line that Jimmy gave, a wonderful answer Jim Baldwin gave in an interview while he was in Istanbul from a reporter from Ebony Magazine. And he says, well, what about hope? And Baldwin, the, the, the interviewer describes Baldwin leaning back, giving him that Baldwin smile mm -hmm. with the drama. And he says, hope is invented every day. Mm. And if hope is invented every day, that means we are beating back despair every day. We just have to figure out how to swing our feet off the bed, plant them on the floor, and get up. So I'm not, in, I have realized it's not about the end. It's about swinging my feet off the bed and creating the conditions where your baby can grow up in a world where she could be the fullest human being she could possibly be and my baby can do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.